Good morning. My name is Ignacio Ramirez. I'll be your moderator for this morning session. And welcome to Archetype Pattern Workshop. This is a school, and it is not a church. And neither are we affiliated with any church or religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational religious and scientific research organization dedicated to proving the existence of Yahweh or Elohim in the operation of the eternal pattern, purpose, and plan operating throughout eternity unto this present day. Now, this school is the result of a, of a divine panoramic vision and revelation given to Henry Clifford Kenley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. And we established schools throughout the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. Archetype Pattern Workshop was established in February 2021. Now in these schools, we use and teach by the true and originated titles for the Heavenly Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name for the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been properly substituted by an order. The true title for the Word or Son is Elohim. It has also been properly substituted by God. And the true name for the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God, they are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. And we now know that each Lord must have a name, each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. This means that Elohim is a title our Creator chose for Himself. Now Jesus is a name. But Jesus is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in the alphabet that would produce a sound made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and rich name our Heavenly Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Now, Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, He is incomprehensible, inscrutable, and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh symbolized in this pure spirit state on this chart as a cloud. Now Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. Now we have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word for son, a super incorporeal being that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. And this shape and form can only be seen in a divine vision and understood in a divine revelation. Later on, the South Saint Spirit manifests himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, who the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we all must know this name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the earth plane. A further understanding of this name and title could be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach a divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. Now after Yahweh led the children of Israel 
out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. And he instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And we go forth to this school to prove that everything in the universe moves and operates according to the structure and function of those threefold tabernacle pattern, and absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now the ten days of school are as follows. Number one is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and as he actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah. Without distinction of race, nationality, breed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstitions, skepticism, and ignorance. Six is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. And seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the dragon, or Satan, and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. And eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation of faith that was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. And ninth is to make known that Yahweh, from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man must be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer state. Our watchword is peace. Our slogan is speak the truth. This morning we have prayer by Dr. Will Williams. Our scripture lesson is... Romans, the first chapter, a scripture reading with Dr. Irene Ramirez, and we have a selection of music after the prayer. Let us all bow our hearts. Well, Heavenly Father Yahweh, we are graciously uh, thankful to be able to meet again in your name, to learn more of your purpose and your plan in accordance to the divine pattern of the universe. We just humbly ask that you pour out upon us more wisdom and knowledge, and more importantly, an understanding so that we might be able to navigate these last days and times. We are truly thankful for the blessings and tender mercies you have bestowed upon us and will bestow upon us. We are thankful for everything that that you've done and the, the things that, and, and continue to be thankful for the things that you will do eternally. We just want to be able to stand before you in that last day without spot and without blemish and blameless in your eyesight. These are things we humbly ask for and other things that you see we sorely stand in need of. In the name of your only begotten Son, Yahshua the Messiah, let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
the first chapter and I'll be reading the Holy Name Bible. Saul, a servant of Yahshua, the Messiah, called to be an apostle, separate unto the glad tidings of Yahweh, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Yahshua, the Messiah our Savior, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of Yahweh with power according to the spirit of the holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom he have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, for his name. Among, among whom are ye also the called the Yahshua the Messiah, to all that be in Rome, beloved of Yahweh, called to be sons, grace to you, and peace from Yahweh, our Father, Yahshua the Messiah. First I thank my Elohim through Yahshua Messiah for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For Yahweh is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, requests, if by any means now I lengthen, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of Yahweh to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end you may be established. That is, 
that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, of oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was hindered hereto, that I might have some fruit among you, also even as among the other nations. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the other nations, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Messiah, for it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For within is the righteousness of Yahweh revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of Yahweh shall be revealed from heaven against all enmity and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which will be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. For Yahweh has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and supernal nature, so they are without excuse. Because that when they knew Yahweh, they glorified him as not as Elohim, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible Elohim into image made like unto the corrupt corruptible man and to the birds and the four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore Yahweh also gave up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of Yahweh into a lie and worshiped to serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this cause Yahweh gave up unto vile affection, afflictions, for even their women did change natural youth into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural youth of the woman, burning their lust one towards another, men with men doing that which is indecent, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was prosper, which was proper. And even as they did not like to retain Yahweh in their knowledge, Yahweh gave them over to the reprobate mind to do those things which are not proper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maladiness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malady, whisperers, Backbiters, back haters, backbiters, haters of Yahweh, despiteful, proud bolsters, inventors of evil things, disobedience to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural afflictions, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of Yahweh that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to the same but to consent with them that do them. I have read Romans, the first chapter. Let's all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All righty, good morning once again, everybody. It's Sunday, we're here to have class. You just keep your undivided attention to the speakers for speaker, and uh, we'll get started. The first speaker will be Dr. Will Williams. Colossal, stupendous, 
panoramic vision of Revelation given to us by Yahweh our Elohim, who is the resurrected Yahshua the Messiah. And uh, what I thought about doing was kind of like, hopefully, I, I want to kind of continue in the vein I kind of went into last session. You know, so maybe this might be considered a part two of it. And last session, I kind of laid out, I thought, a decent foundation as far as the mystery of iniquity and this track hmm. through the ages here all the way up to the modern era. And I was more or less focusing on this chart here because this is the last chart that Dr. Kenley drew, okay? And uh, they call it the map, but you know, but everybody calls it a Daniel chart and probably most people don't know how that term came in. That term came about from Lee Warren, you know, who, uh, who, who uh, died recently. He was the one that came up with the, the term Daniel chart hmm. because it has Nebuchadnezzar's dream imposed on the map of the Roman Empire. Okay? All right, now, I wanted to get into the more modern aspect, so I'm not going to do what I did last week. So if you want to at some time, you can look at the previous session to kind of get a, a more persnickety idea of the foundation of the mystery of iniquity. First starting in, in heaven, in the angelic creation where there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels cast out the devil and his angels. Alright, and seeing you read it, well maybe we could just read that a little bit, because I'm not going to get put, but I gotta have a foundation, I gotta start somewhere. So let's go to the 12th chapter of Revelations. And uh, you're reading out of a holy name, I take it? Yes. Okay, so you're probably going to see the second verse, probably. Yes. All right. Revelations 12 and 2. Uh-huh. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, mm -hmm. a woman clothed in the sun, mm -hmm. and a moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she being with child, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Mm -hmm. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns on his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood the, before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, to devour her child, as soon as it was born. Okay, and, I'll hold it right there. Alright. Uh, now, I'll just use this as to save time at this pause. Supposing you're going to get the um, these other plates. Uh huh. All right. Here. Uh, I'll read that last line again. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Uh huh. And behold, a great red dragon, mm -hmm. having seven heads and ten horns, mm -hmm. and seven crowns upon his head. Mm hmm. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Mm -hmm. I said, here they are, see. He drew a third part of the stars from heaven. But keep reading, though. And they cast them to the earth. All right, they cast them to the earth. Okay, read. And the dragon stood before the woman, mm -hmm. which was ready to be delivered, to devour her child as soon as it was born. Okay, now, this is the unformed earth. Right. Here, you know, the, um, the earth that is how Dr. Kidley uh explained it, an amalgamated conglomeration of a coring mass. How, you know, and, but everything is there. All the elements are there. Even the man Adam is there, right. but, but in a chaotic state, or in a state that you can't recognize, put it like that. Until it's, see, this is inorganic, until it is organized. But see, but here's Satan here, you know, going, seeking to and fro whom he may devour, and he's standing before the earth, waiting, waiting for it to be devoured, you know, to mm -hmm. devour whatever it, it bursts out. And it did. Because when you look up here, <clears throat> you look up here, the days of creation, see? See, here's, here's Elohim, here's this dove here, here's Elohim moving across the face of the deep. Now, as long as Elohim was out here, Satan ain't going to do nothing. Mm -hmm. He's just sitting back and he's watching. He's watching Elohim create, you know, you know, according to Moses' vision, the first day of creation, second day of creation, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. All right, and see, and, and, and uh, same day doing nothing. Okay, oh, well, since I got it here, yeah. 
Let's go over here. See, now, when Moses sees... Oh, come back up here, I'm sorry. That's right. Here's Moses. He's, this is the second trip up the mount. And this is the first time he sees the vision of the heavens and the earth. All right? And so he sees Adam and Eve up here in peace and in harmony. And Elohim resting on the seventh day. Seven days. It took seven solar days for Moses to watch this. Mm -hmm. The other 33 days, he sees the tabernacle being formed. So all together, you know, you know, Mo Moses is up here 40 days, okay? And he comes down, deals with the Israelite, building a golden calf, etc. Then he takes it, breaks the tables of stone that he had gotten from that trip. Then he's got to bring up his own heart. And then he goes up here and gets a recapitulation of the vision and see him this time. He sees everything, but this time he sees the devil entering into the garden. Okay? So we'll see, and that's the difference. See, and the reason, and see, just draw a line here, and see, the reason why this plate is here, angelic transgression, is to show you or point out to you the cause of the Edenic transgression up here. Okay? That's the reason. See, now here's Adam and Eve up here in peace and in harmony, and here's Satan coming into the garden to spy out their nakedness. Okay? I know some people say, see that, see the angels, oh, that's Yahshua, and all this. No, it is not. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you straight up. That's Satan entering into the garden, spying on their nakedness, okay? All right. And then the transgression happens, and then we had uh, Cain, who was incarnated with that satanic spirit. See, see, the intercourse, see, there was an intercourse happening between Satan and Eve right. on a spiritual level, all right? And see, spiritually speaking, Cain was the result of that. Now, if you would have took Cain onto the Maury show or something, or, or Judge Lake or whoever, mm -hmm. you know, do a DNA test, it would say, Adam, you are the father, because physically he is. Mm -hmm. But spiritually, he was the product of right. Satan and Eve. Mm -hmm. Now, Satan appeared unto Eve. He did not incarnate in Eve. He appeared unto her. Mm -hmm. See, that's why here, when you understand this plate, see here... You have Satan, I mean, uh, Lucifer up here in heaven. Here you have the veils. See, angelic invisibility. That simply means it's not revealed. You can't see behind it. But then once he's, once the trans, once the war in heaven starts and Michael's angel kicks him out, see, now he's gone through that veil. Now he's in the holy place here, see, and now he's in a state of incorporeal visibility. That means he can appear to somebody in a vision. That's why, uh, like, um, well, just, you could draw a line. Let me see here. Just to kind of if I could do this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Here's this. Look here. In the holy place. Here's Satan here. Here's Michael, you know, casting Satan. He cast Satan out and then one third followed him out. Okay. But now Satan here can appear in the state of incorporeal visibility. In other words, he can appear in a vision. Just draw a line. See, so draw a straight line, and see, and I can come over here, draw a straight line, and I can come over here, here, here's Joshua, here's Satan appearing in a vision to Joshua out here in the wilderness of Judea after he had been baptized by John the Baptist. But this is here, I'm talking about Satan appearing in a vision, mm -hmm. see? So I'm just trying to show principles here about the veils, okay, in this case. See, because the veils represent points of transition right, right. from one state to another, or, or from in this case, from invisibility to a state of incorporeal visibility, and then passing through the veils again, a division between visibility and invisibility. And now here, they got to look for some body. I'm talking about the demonic angels, the demoted angels. They have to incarnate in right. the body. All right? Whereas the righteous angels, like Michael Gabriel, when they come through these veils, they can take on a body or appear in the likeness of sinful flesh. You wouldn't know it. That's how, like with Abraham, Abraham entertained a couple of strangers, see, and, and it, you know, and they were angels in disguise. And he, but he couldn't, you couldn't tell them apart. I mean, because they sat down and ate, you right. know, and everything else. They just looked just like, you know, what I'm saying, you wouldn't know, because see, they're in the likeness of sinful flesh when they come through these veils. But anyway, I wanted to bring that out about the war, because up here, this is where Satan is to, in, is to, uh instituted a government up here, mm -hmm. right? And the reason why I can say that, because I could draw a line here, and I could see King Saul. 
See, the first king of Israel, he, Yahweh sanctioned him to do a government. You know, they, the people wanted a king. Yahweh told them, you know, get, you know that's okay. I'm going to give them a king after their own heart, which he did. Then for 40 years, Saul had a satanic rule right. up here. See, which is a reflective of the satanic rule that Lucifer had up in heaven. Saul ruled for 40 years. So that tells me over here that Lucifer ruled for about an hour. Because one hour is 40 years in prophetic time. Okay? But anyway... So we got that down, and then, and then we see Cain. See, he's incarnated in Cain, and then Cain, what did he do? He built, you know, he murdered his brother. We went through this last week. You see, he murdered his brother, and then he was, uh, Yahweh yeah, put the mark on him, put the mark of the sixth on him, of the shepherd's crook, which is six. And then here, and him and his wife, you know, his wife is 40 weeks pregnant, that's the 40 prince. And he's telling her, okay, well, you know, we're going to come up. You know, and we're going to build a city, and you have a little garden. And then she gave birth to Enoch, which was coming through the matrix, or the opening here. And then here's Cain sitting here, between his son and his wife, imitating the Ark of the Covenant. See, as if he has the power. And he's king and high priest, mm -hmm. okay? So now this is the first attempt, you know, this is Satan incarnated in, in man. And so because of this wickedness, and it, it calls for the flood to happen. Right? But you can't kill, a, you know, you can't kill demons like that. You can kill the, the host, but not the demons. So the, all mankind died, but those demons crossed over into the next age. Right. Okay, and as we went through last week, they went and built the Tower of Babel. And this is where the instance of human government comes in. All right? And so now, and, human, and, and if there was ever a time when they could have got it together, it would have been here. But, you know, but they went from bad to worse. And Yahweh came down and confused their tongues, okay? So now we go on here, and matter of fact, when we go on down to, uh, see, and Moses sees all this. Let me, let me, let me, let me, just since I went through the thing with Moses, Moses sees all of this. Right. See, the second time in the recapitulation, because he saw the 63 generations of the flesh coming out of Abraham, I mean Adam, the, uh, the transgression, and he sees all of this coming down, all right? Even down, even even sees Nebuchadnezzar and these kingdoms that's coming. See, he sees all the way down to uh, where am I at here? Yeah, to Pentecost. I'm talking about Moses. He right. sees the, he sees the thing all the way down to Pentecost. All right, the end of it. See Yahshua Messiah. He sees Yahshua coming in. His death, burial, resurrection, ascension, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Moses sees all of that all the way down, but he's told not to write. He's only told to write up to the end of his life, which, is, which constitutes the, the first five books of the Bible. Right. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay? So now, I want to relay that from foundation from last week. So then, if you would get um, Daniel, the um, second chapter, the 31st verse, and uh, while he's getting that, she's, or whoever's going to get it, I need, uh, yeah, I need some plates. Yeah, because I need to correlate. And these are nice, you know, but if they were separate, then I could correlate them a lot. Maybe 20 seconds. Daniel, the second chapter, 31st verse. Okay. And what I need, I need plate 26. I need the Godhead plate. And... Uh, Is that plate number one, or? Well, the the heart, yeah, the theosophy plate God did. Uh, no, no, yeah, and uh, the history plate, plate twenty six, plate twenty six, yeah, and uh, just just get them and just keep them on standby until um, until we get the scripture read here. Now, while he's looking for that, just to prelude this, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream here in which uh, it was so terrible, it was so terrible to him that he couldn't even remember the dreams, but, but, but he knew it was terrible. It was frightening to him. So he asked his Psychic Friends Network if they would uh, interpret it for him. And they were like, oh sure, old king, we'll do that for you, just tell us what the dream is. And he's like, well, I can't remember what the dream is, so you need to tell me what, what I dream and the interpretation thereof. And they're like, oh come on, man, nobody can really do that. And so the whole pal palace was in a panic about this. All right? And then it, it caught the ears of Daniel. And see, he inquired, you know, they said, well, the, the king said that, you know, he's going to kill you know, everybody who, who cannot interpret this dream. Let, you know, tell him. 
if they, anybody who cannot tell him what the dream is and interpret it. See, they, they didn't even know what the dream, they don't even know what the dream is. So Daniel in, inquired of Yahweh, and Yahweh gave him an answer. And so now, at this point that we're getting ready to read, see, Daniel is, uh, let's see, let me put this down. Yeah, since I have some plates here, some bigger plates. See, Daniel is standing before King Nebuchadnezzar, who is king of the world, mind you. Mm -hmm. All right? The great and awesome Nebuchadnezzar II, king of Babylon, ruler of the world. And, uh. Mm, mm, okay, you want the Godhead and then. 26. 26, right? Yes. Okay, those two. All right, those two are fine. See now, and so he's standing before Nebuchadnezzar, and he's going to explain to Nebuchadnezzar, one, what it is that he dreamed, and two, the explanation of it. Now, mind you, when Daniel's getting ready to, all right, now, Daniel's getting ready to, he's standing before Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, you know, because as kings are, you know, they're not at eye level. You know, he's like on a throne, and the throne is, you know, elevated. So Daniel, you know, he's at this, you know, he's got a genuflect, and what is it? And he's getting ready to address King Nebuchadnezzar, ruler of the world. Again. Daniel, second chapter, and. 31. 31. Daniel, second chapter, 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image, the image head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them into pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is a dream and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. All right, hold on. Is the microphone broke? <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, what he just read, Nebuchadnezzar, okay, first of all, as we said, Nebuchadnezzar could not remember the dream. Mm -hmm. So, as Daniel is speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, the Holy Spirit in Daniel is bringing it back to Nebuchadnezzar's remembrance as Daniel is speaking. Right. Okay, so now first he had to tell Nebuchadnezzar what it was he dreamed. And as he's telling Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is he's visualizing, I mean, it's coming back to his remembrance in his mind. The images, are, he's, he's, it's all coming back to him. Now, Daniel had to explain what the image was first. Mm -hmm. Now he's going to explain what does it mean. First he had to tell him what the vision is that Nebuchadnezzar had, now he's going to give him the revelation. All right, go ahead. All right, 36. This is a dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Mm -hmm. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the Eloah of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break into pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. 
And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. Mm -hmm. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with merry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the law of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It shall stand forever. For as much as, <clears throat> for as, much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great Eloah has made known to the king that shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Okay. Then, That's good enough. All right, now, got that in there. All right? This is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. See, now, um, let's see what we do this. I want Genesis 28 and 10 right quick. Alright. Okay, I don't, I don't mind. Genesis 28 and 10. Uh -huh. And Jacob went out from Beersheba. Went out from Beersheba. Listen carefully, Lord, right, to this, and because I'm going to take this and I'm going to apply it to, to this. Go ahead. And Jacob went out from Beersheba uh -huh. and went towards Haran. Uh huh. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones okay. of that place and put them for his pil for his pillows mm -hmm. and lay down in a place to sleep. Now, stop. Sleep. Sleep is a type of death. Right. And death is a type of sleep. So that's what's happening here with Jacob. All right. Which is the same thing that's happening here. With Nebuchadnezzar. That's why we got Nebuchadnezzar here. Look here on the chart. He's in the position. Where is he at on the position in the chart? Ain't he's in the court round about. Mm -hmm. He's at that on the altar of sin. He's asleep. So he's, it's a type of death. Just like Jacob over here. See, he's asleep. He's in a type of death. Okay? Read. 12. And he dreamed. Stop. Now he dreamed. Now he is immersed. And get it? First, he's, he's in a type of death, he's sleep. Now he's immersed right. in a dream. Nebuchadnezzar, he's in a type of death. Now he is immersed in a dream. Read. And he dreamed, and behold, the ladder set up the earth on top of it, reached to the heavens, and mm -hmm. behold, the angels of Elohim ascending and descending on it. All right, hold it. Now, here's Jacob. He's asleep. He's going through a death, and he's buried. Now he is elevated in the spirit. So he's up here in the third heaven. And he sees angels ascending and descending on this veil. All right? Here's Nebuchadnezzar. He's asleep. Type of death. He's immersed mm -hmm. in a dream. And he is elevated in the spirit, and he sees angels too, ascending and descending. What angels are that? Not the righteous ones, nope. the unrighteous angels that inhabit these governments. As, as, you get it now? Mm -hmm. Ascending and deep, because that's what these governments do. Ascend, they rise and fall. Right. You see the point I'm making here? The pattern is consistent, and you can apply it to to everything. Mm -hmm. And that's all I'm trying to show here, that Yahweh is showing Nebuchadnezzar. He's showing him, according to a vision, these, these universal dynasties. That's what Dr. Kinley called them. These are, there are many kingdoms in the world, big and small, but these are the universal dynasties. These are the ones that run the world. All right? That's why I always say, when you look here, See, it's why Dr. Kennedy put Nebuchadnezzar's dream here, because when you study history and go backwards, you got to go through these kingdoms. Mm -hmm. You have to go through these kingdoms to get back here to the Garden of Eden. 
This is the history of Western civilization. Right. Now, there are other civilizations, mind you. You know, you can bring them up, you know. I mean, different people have different empires all over the world. Genghis Khan, you know, you can read about the Mughal Empire of India, or the, or the empires that were here in this, in these conflicts, the Aztecs, the Incas, the Mayas, or even where I come from, Illinois. You ever hear of the Cahox, the mm -hmm. mound dwellers, the mound builders? They built their own, yeah, I know about that. I grew up, you know, I remember when I was, I'm not far from there in Alton. I remember as a kid, they used to take us on school trips to Cahokia, Illinois, to, to, to visit the Cahok Indians who were the mound builders. And they told us about that. I mean, so there's civilizations galore. But these are universal dynasties, right. see, that rule the world that has an influence on the world. Even today, you got different countries and stuff, but it's Western civilization that is the big influence of the world today, for the most part. And this is how, and this is where it comes from. This is the track, you know, that has come down through history. So if we were to trace it back like America, here in America we would trace our history back here to England. Then England would trace its history back to Papal Rome, which traces its history back to Pagan Rome, back to the Greeks, back to the Medes and the Persians, back to the second Babylonian Empire, which Nebuchadnezzar, which goes back to the first Babylonian Empire under Nimrod, which goes back to Cain and the city of Enoch, which goes back to hmm. Adam and Eve, back up here in the garden. And see, and we showed you with Lucifer, see, where he was cast out of heaven, down here to the earth. So we see the origin of that, and we see it coming on down. See, as mankind is incarnated, by these, uh, well, let's see, let's read that. Since I said that, get a uh, third chapter of uh, Genesis. Genesis 3 and 1. Now the serpent was more subtile than any beast of the field, mm -hmm. which Yahweh Elohim had made. Now, see, that, that was, if you remember, I showed you that illustration. See, of him, he, it here? here he is, here he is, sneaking into the garden, more, sub, more subtle, yeah, okay, I thought that was me, I felt like Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> yeah. see, he is more, see, he's, he's sneaking, he's entering into the garden and he's spying out their nakedness. See, that's, right. how he, that's him being subtle. All right, go ahead. And he said unto the woman, Hath Elohim said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? All right, now see, uh, what is, I want a good illustration. Ah, right here. This is, I love this illustration because see, they're, they're having a conversation here. Here's Eve, and here's Lucifer appearing to her in a vision, as we said, in a state of incorporeal visibility. So now he's having a conversation. Go ahead and start that again. And he said unto the woman, Hath Elohim said, Ye shall not eat of, e of every tree of the garden? Mm -hmm. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, No death will ye die, for Elohim doth know that in the day ye eat of them, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof. Mm -hmm. Now look, look how this illustration is. Now Adam is sitting here, and he's looking at Eve, who's looking at the tree. He, does, Adam does not see Lucifer, because people have asked me that. Well, did, well, did Adam see Lucifer? No, Lucifer only appeared unto her. But Adam is looking at Eve, who's looking at this tree. Right. See, and so he's looking at it and saying, okay, girl, what are you thinking? <laughs> what do you think it is? But read. And did eat and gave also unto her husband. And he did gave her. also to her husband, which he which he knew was wrong, but he but he did it anyway. Because he took responsibility for her. 
All right, go ahead. And he did eat. Uh huh. And the eyes of them both were open. Uh huh. And they knew that they were naked. Mm -hmm. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim as they were walking in the garden mm -hmm. in the cool of the day. In the cool of the day. Now the sun was in the zenith of the sky all this time, which means that it was up here, it was a type of the day, the day of eternity. Right. But then when the transgression happened, see, both suns, the S-O-N, and the S-U-N are going down together. That's why you see the sun here going into a sunset position towards death because that's what's happening, because it's a reflection of what's happening within the man. Both suns are going down together. Okay? The cool of the day. Go ahead, quickly. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh Elohim amongst the trees of the garden. And Yahweh Elohim called unto the man and said unto him, Where art thou? Mm -hmm. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, mm -hmm. and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree there, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Mm -hmm. And the man said, The woman, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me. Mm -hmm. She gave me of the tree, and mm -hmm. I did eat. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm watching her. Mm -hmm. I didn't stop her, but she took the part of the tree. She she gave it to me, and and I did eat. Now look, they weren't even supposed to touch the tree, you know, let alone eat the fruit from it. But anyway, keep reading. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the woman, mm -hmm. What is this that thou hast done? Mm -hmm. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. The serpent beguiled me. You know, she he tricked me, you know, and he tricked him. He tricked her by telling her the truth in the, in the sense that he told her that if you eat of it, you'll be just like Elohim. Now realize it, she was already like Elohim. Mm -hmm. See, but see, but but this is part of the purpose of Yahweh. Because when the woman was taken out of the man, see, we read that the woman was clothed in the sun. Right. See, that's how we started off with this. That's where it was up here, when Adam was created here. See, he was... The woman here is clothed in the sun. Then he was put into a deep sleep, and the, and the, rib, the rib and the womb taken out, and a womb man brought to him. Huh. Right? But when she was taken out of him, she became subject to vanity. See? That was Yahweh that did that. That wasn't her fault. Yahweh did that. If it was up to, were it up to Eve, Eve would have been content to stay within Adam, within her husband. But according to the purpose, he took the woman out and made her subject to vanity. And see, and that's what's happening really, and that's really the problem with the world today. It is subject to vanity. Okay, but quickly read, because I gotta and get I to the point. Eat. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, uh -huh. and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, mm -hmm. and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, dust shall he eat all the days of his life, meaning what? He has to be incarnated in the flesh. Right. Period. See? And that's what we said about those demons. They, they have to be incarnated in the flesh, whereas the righteous angels, they don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. They can just take on a body and appear in the likeness of simple flesh. Shake your hand, walk down the street with you, eat a meal with you, whatever. You wouldn't know. Okay, but that's the point I wanted to bring out with that. See, but keep reading. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Now I'm going to put enmity or open hatred between the woman and between thee and the woman. Read. And between thy seed and her seed. And between thy seed and her seed. That was manifested by Cain. See, go ahead. He shall bruise thy head. Uh huh. And thou shalt bruise his heel. That's why we have this thing here. Because the seed of the woman is him. And he's gonna, he's gonna, he, he will bruise, he, the serpent, will bruise his heel. But he will bruise his head. Okay? See, that's why, and that's, and that's signified by the rock that we read about right. in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Okay? See, I just wanted to try to pull all this to show you that this is all correlated and it's part of the purpose. Okay? Now, I want to go with this. Um, since I brought this up about the kingdoms here, 
Let's bring, I, I, I'll bring this into, into play. These beasts up here. That's Daniel the seventh chapter, or it might be the fifth chapter in the holy name. Because this is a corollary. This is a, what Daniel is receiving here with these beasts is a confirmation vision of what Yahweh showed Nebuchadnezzar and what Yahweh showed Daniel as far as the, the vision and the interpretation mm -hmm. thereof. This is a confirmation of it. What do you have? Daniel, 5th uh, chapter, Holy Name. In the first year of Belshazzar, king mm -hmm. of Babylon, mm -hmm. Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Mm -hmm. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, mm -hmm. and four great beasts came up from the sea. I see now from the sea. Now people think it's from like the Mediterranean mm -hmm. Sea or the Black Sea. No, it's talking about the sea mm -hmm. of men. That's where these empires rise up out of. The sea of men. Quickly. Diverse one from another. Mm -hmm. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Okay, now, this is correlated with that golden head of Nebuchadnezzar. See, that's what that's correlated to. This beast is correlated to, to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, that golden head. Okay, continue. And behold, another beast, a second like to the, a bear, and it raised itself, it raised up itself on one side, mm -hmm. and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Okay, now that Medes and per the bit now that's correlated to the Medes and the Persian Empire, Cyrus the Great, Cyrus Darius, and Artaxerxes. Those are the kings. There were more than that, the Persian kings, but. Those are the three that are mentioned in the Bible. Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. But that's the, what this bear is pointing to. Also note above the bear, we have the hammer and the sickle, which, which belong to the former USSR, or the, the Soviet, or what we know, what we knew as the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. right? and, and we'll touch on that, and hopefully we've got enough time, we'll get to that. But that's pointed at the de to that, because Yahweh repeats his purpose right. throughout the scriptures, you know, and I remember Dr. Kinley saying this, you know, in a lecture, he said, look, if you want to know about what's going on in the world today, read the Old Testament. Well, we're doing that. Nebuchadnezzar's dream and all this other stuff we just read, it's in the Old Testament. Okay, but continue quickly. After this, I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, mm -hmm. and dominion was given to it. Okay, now that's compared to the Greeks. See, Alexander the Great. See, because that's the way they say that's how he was. He was, he was quick and, and stealthy, like a leopard. All right? And when he died, he left no heir. So his kingdom was divided up amongst his four generals. That's what the four wings and the four heads typify. Mm -hmm. See, but that's correlated to that waste of brass, which is Greece. Okay, continue. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. Mm -hmm. It devoured and brake it in pieces. Yeah, can you move the mic a little bit here, yeah, because I can yeah, get that. Okay. Go ahead. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. Mm -hmm. It devoured and brake in pieces, mm -hmm. and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Mm -hmm. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, 
and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did mm -hmm. sit. Mm -hmm. The Ancient of Days, which is compared to that rock in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. That's the corollary I'm making. If these beasts here are correlated to the different parts of this image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, then the Ancient of Days that's coming along to deal with these beasts is correlated to this rock, the stone cut out of the mountains without hands, that dealt with Nebuchadnezzar's image. Okay? Go ahead. Whose garment was white as snow, mm -hmm. and the hair of his head like pure wool. Mm -hmm. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Mm -hmm. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, thousands, thousands ministers, and unto thousand thousands ministers unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Mm -hmm. The judgment was set, and the books were open. Mm -hmm. I beheld them because of the voice of the great words mm -hmm. which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dom dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. Mm -hmm. Okay, good enough. All right, now, now that's in the Old Testament that we're laying up an additional foundation to what I went through in the previous session, okay? I just hope I'm, I can get to where I want to go to on time. Okay, now, since I have this up here. Satan said, read 14 quickly. One, one get Isaiah 14 and 12, the other one get Ezekiel 28 and 11. Uh, you want me to read Ezekiel first? I want, I want Isaiah first. Isaiah 14. Fourteen and twelve? Yeah. Isaiah fourteen and twelve. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Mm -hmm. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of El. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou sought, yet thou sought and brought down to the grave, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as the wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? that opened not the house of his prisoners. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave in an abominable, br abominable branch, and as a raiment of those that are slain, thrust Good through... Enough. All right, good enough. Thank you. All right, I will be like the Most High. Here's the Most High. Is that better? Mm. All right. Here's the Most High. This is how he is constructed, the Most High. Come out. Elohim, when he takes on shape and form. Because he's coming through the veils, too, just like when we did with the angelic transgression and, 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 and uh, that plate. Inscrutable, incomprehensible. Inscrutable, incomprehensible. Angelic invisibility. It's the same thing in principle. You can't see him because he's, he's behind a veil. In this case, the veil would be pure spirit, which we, would, which we depict as the cloud. But pure spirit in this particular case would be like the veil. He's coming through the veil, and he's taking on shape and form, intelligence coming in first, flanked by wisdom and knowledge, forming a triad. Then this set of triad attributes gives birth to the next set of attributes, beauty, flanked by love and justice. 
this set of attributes give birth to the next set of attributes. Foundation, flanked by power, strength, and all nine of these attributes are embedded in the tenth attribute, which is the kingdom. And this was set up before the foundation of the world. Right. He said, I'm going to be like the most high. All right. So now, and look, just look, look at him. You know, he's standing up here and his arms folded like him. I'm going to be like the most high. Now we can read Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28 and 10. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised oh. by the hand of strength. No, 111. Oh, 1011. Ezekiel 28 and 11. I think it's 28. Go ahead. Moreover, the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, uh -huh. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, mm -hmm. and say unto him, mm -hmm. Thus saith Yahweh, thou sealest up mm -hmm. the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Mm -hmm. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of Elohim. Oh, so no, wait a minute, hold on. See, we got, we, didn't we just read that? Mm -hmm. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of Elohim. Go ahead. Every precious stone was thy covering. Oh, wait a minute. Every precious stone. Wait a minute. Whoa, let's wait, slow down here. Every precious stone was thy covering. What do you mean here? See, this is the. these attributes are precious stones. See? See? And this is what the whole universe is made out of. Because we tell you all the time that matter right. is spirit materialized. So if that be the case, what is spirit? Don't we tell you all the time spirit is, not you know, spirit is. Wisdom, intelligence, knowledge, love, beauty, justice, violence, and power. That's what Yahweh is. It's not what he possesses. It's what he is. Then these attributes, in part, took on shape and form, not in totality. Then this is the first cause of creation. Right. And then the creation is drawn out of, out of Elohim. So therefore, the creation is made out of the same attributes that he is. So what you're looking at around is the manifestation of intelligence, wisdom, knowledge, love, beauty, justice, foundation, power, strength in the kingdom. This is what he's imitated, the same attributes, and he's made the whole earth his kingdom. Because he said, I will be like the most high. Okay? Go ahead. The Sardis. Okay, now, he's, here it is. He's got to say, say, these attributes. See, the Sardis, which is intelligence. So I'm talking about Lucifer. He has the same attributes earlier and said, I'm just pointing them out. Intelligence, read. Topaz. Wisdom. And the diamond. Knowledge. The barrel. Beauty. The onyx. Love. And the jasper. Justice. And the sapphire. Foundation. The emerald. Power. And the carbuncle. Strength. And gold. Kingdom. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in the day in the in the day that thou was created. Mm -hmm. Thou art the anointed cherub that cover covered. Mm -hmm. Now he's the anointed cherub. Why is he saying that? Mm -hmm. The anointed cherub that covered. Because he's on the veil. See, he's on the veil here. He's the anointed cherub that covered. See, and it's covering you, the world. Right. The anointed the an who anointed him? It was Yahweh that anointed him. Yahweh Elohim that anointed him to be that and to do that. Right. The anointed cherub that covereth. Go ahead. And I have set thee so. And Yahweh set him that way. Go ahead. Thou was upon the holy mountain of Elohim. The holy mountain of Elohim. See, that's what we showed you. The, yeah. The holy mountain of Elohim. Go ahead. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. The stones of fire being the angels. Mm -hmm. See, he walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. How else was he? How else would he have been able to draw one third of an innumerable right. host away if he was not up in the in the midst of them? Go ahead. Thou was perfect in thy ways uh -huh. from the day that thou was created, mm -hmm. till iniquity was found in thee. Now, who put that iniquity in him? Mm -hmm. See, that was Elohim. In other words, he was a time bomb. You know, you know that's what these terrorists do. You know, they, you know, they get a, t you know, they, you know, have a time bomb. You know, set it off, might go off a half hour, hour, something like that. Wait, you know, they're gone away. You know, because they're getting out of as fast as they can. You know, but Yahweh set him up that way, just like Yahweh set up the world. He set him up that way, and see, look, 
back here with King Saul. See, the, the children of Israel wanted a king. Right. They said, make us a king like everybody. We want to be like everybody else. Make us a king. And, you know, they went to Samuel. And Samuel treated Yahweh and said, look, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. But that's okay. I'm going to give them a king after their own heart. And he did. He gave them Saul. See, it's a, see, and the reason why I can look at that, because it's the same way here in the angelic creation. See, Yahweh foreknew that one-third of the innumerable host wanted the leader, wanted, you know, wanted, wanted the leader, wanted, wanted the king. Right. They rejected Elohim, but they wanted, they wanted to say, give us a king, and Yahweh gave them one. I'm talking about that one-third. He gave them a king after their own heart. And, he, and when he kicked Lucifer out, that one-third followed him out. The reason why I know that is because it's the same way here. When Adam and Eve, see, Eve was the one that, that initiated all of this, but Adam took responsibility. So when Adam was kicked out, she followed him out. Mm -hmm. Just like th those demons followed Lucifer out. Keep your finger there. You, you get, oh boy. Romans 8 and 20. Get Romans 8 and 20. You, you can keep reading. Yeah, you can keep reading. By the multitude of thy merchandise. Uh huh, uh huh. They have filled the midst of thee with violence. Merchandise, see, right there. See, buying and selling. I, I sell you a lie, mm -hmm. you buy it. See, and that's what human government is. Human government sells you the lie that they can that that they are, that they can save you in some kind of way. That, you know, that's that our gov that the government can make you. Prosperous or whatever, and see, and, and there's no no system of government that can do that. There is none. There is, and, and people have tried. People have tried. See, you see, they've tried, and they all fail at one point or another. Even the Roman Empire, as long as it did last, and it did last a thousand years, but it fell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it couldn't last forever. See, see, that's what Satan tried. He's trying to come up with something that'll last. This is a king. This kingdom last forever. You know, I'm talking about the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah. But his kingdom, see, this is this is temporal. Right. But see, but that's the delusion. People think people don't think that. See, they just say, well, you know, they, and then part of it is that, well, our government, America, we've we've had the great democracy for like 250 years now, you know, like you really did something. Hmm. You know? <laughs> you know, and now you said they're talking about, oh, our democracy is in trouble. Well, well, well it's so great, why is it in trouble? <laughs> okay? But we're showing you why. We're going to show you why it's in trouble. I hope you get this. And thou hast sinned. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain mm -hmm. of Elohim. Mm -hmm. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, mm -hmm. from the midst of the stones of fire. Mm -hmm. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Mm -hmm. Thy has corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Mm -hmm. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, mm -hmm. and they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities, mm -hmm. by the iniquity of thy traffic. The iniquity of thy traffic, man. Just buying and selling. And that's everything. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, everything. Literally. Okay, go ahead. Therefore will I bring forth a fire fr from the midst mm -hmm. of thee. Mm -hmm. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all of them that behold thee. Mm -hmm. All... They that know thee among the people mm -hmm. shall be astonished at thee. They're going to be astonished at the, at the destruction that's going to happen to these, well, to the world, because the whole world is one, <laughs> it's one city now. They're going to be astonished at thee, like, oh, what oh, oh, <laughs> Thou shalt be a terror, uh -huh. and never shalt thou be any more. You're going to be a terror, but then there will come a point where you won't even be anymore. In other words, you won't even exist. Right. Because you and everything else of this will go into the lake of fire. Okay. Romans 8 and 20. 8 and 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity. Now the creature, which creature is that? The woman. Right. She was made subject to vanity. To, here's the vanity, Lucifer. She was made subject to vanity. Read. 
Not willingly. Not willingly, because she had nothing to do with Elohim taking the rib and the womb out from Adam and presenting a womb man. She had nothing to do with that. Not willingly. But, we, but by reason of him who hath subjugated the same in hope. Now, the same who have subject the, is that, did it say subjugated? It says subjugated. S-U-B-J-U-J-E-C-T. What's the same in the King James Version? Uh, that, that's that boy. <laughs> so, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm reading it incorrectly. Okay. Subjected uh, subject. the same in hope. Thank you. A subject. Yes, wait a minute. <laughs> I had to think about, to think that's about a new that word. word. <laughs> uh, okay, have subject. Okay, see, she was made subject to vanity, but by the same token, she was also made subject in hope, meaning she was made subject to her husband. And she. And when Adam was kicked out, she followed her hope out. Okay? She followed her hope. All right? Um, okay. Now, I got the boy. I think I'm doing okay so far. Get to Isaiah 27 and 1. Isaiah 27 and 1. Uh -huh. in, the, in that day, Yahweh with his sore and great and strong sword mm -hmm. shall punish Leviathan, uh -huh. the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent. Yeah, we got him right here. Here he is, Leviathan, that piercing serpent, that crooked serpent mm -hmm. that lives in the sea, the sea of men. Go ahead, read. And shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Mm -hmm. In the day... Sing ye unto her a vineyard of red wine. Mm -hmm. I, Yahweh, do keep it. I will water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I will keep it night and day. Mm -hmm. Fury is not in me. Who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. That's good enough. Because it talked about that woman with that cup. See, and Daniel right. and, uh, John's going to confirm that. Revelations. Revelations. Now, uh, why do I go with this? Mm. Revelations, the 13th chapter, and I want the textbook. I want Biden, Biden 2. I got 13. Did you want some water? Uh, not yet. No, not quite yet. But I appreciate the, the thought. Plus, I still got a little bit. Revelations 13. Well, uh, before you read that, I want the textbook, volume 2. Volume 2, page uh, 43. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, as a matter of fact, since we're over here, we may as well. I want you to start, uh, go down to the paragraph that says, by using the tabernacle pattern, plate number four. I want you to start that paragraph, is like in the middle. Okay. Uh, volume two, page 43. Uh huh. By using the tabernacle pattern, plate number four, as a pattern plate with the blood of the horns as the brazen altar of labor, two, water in the brazen labor, and three, the spirit in the sanctuary or holy place containing the golden candlestick, the golden table of shewbread, and the golden altar of incense, and placing it on each of the other plates, you can see that the historical events that took place in the creation were purposed by foreordained by Elohim from the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. For example, the blood that was put on the four horns of the altar of sacrifice, plate number four, was as the blood of the migratory trap, plate number three, but on the two side posts on the intel, on the lintel, of the door and dipped from the basin 
at the bottom, making four points of blood at the Passover in Egypt. Likewise, in plate number two, showing the flood, Noah was told to warn the wicked of the four corners of the earth whose blood was upon their heads, Ezekiel 33, 4 through 6. That died in the flood, plate number one, shows the death of Adam who died in his, his consciousness in the same day that he transgressed the law of Yahweh and also died 70 years short of a thousand years or one day with Yahweh. His death blood passed upon all men. Now let us go uh, to the plate number five, which shows the death of Yahshua the Messiah who has who came to fulfill all things. He was from his birth prepared a prepared sacrifice slain from the foundation of the world. John 3.16, Revelations 13 and 8, with four points of blood. One, a crown of thorns on his head. Two and three, nails in his right and left hand. Four, a nail in his feet. This blood this blood witness shown in plate number six is also shown in the lower section of the bottom plates, namely plate number seven, the crucifixion of the Messiah. Plate number eight, the cup of the Last Supper, symbolizing the blood of the Messiah. Plate number nine, the persecution starting with blood of Stephen. Acts 7 chapter symbolized by the dragon in Revelations right. having seven heads and ten hordes painted Rome. All right, note that. See, because a lot of people have always asked, well, why is this dragon here on this plate? And there's and it's a point here that Dr. Kinley is making with showing on this plate that is applicable to what I'm going to show you on the Daniel chart. So now he's got the dragon here, see, which represents pagan Rome. Mm -hmm. All right, read. Plate number ten, the death of blood of James, the right. brother of John, mm -hmm. Acts 12-2, uh, mm -hmm. by King Herod, symbolized by the beast having seven heads and ten horns, like unto the leopard, mm -hmm. papal room. See Revelations 13, 1-2. See, yeah, we're going to read, we're, we're going to read Revelations, okay? See, we're going to read it, see, but I wanted to show you that why this is here in the textbook and why it's on the plate like this. Okay, uh, go ahead and finish it out. Who received his power from pagan Rome, uh -huh. the dragon. Plate 11 shows the restored carnal ordinances practiced by the apostle, apostate church in the present dispensation, including the cup of transubstantiation claimed by the Roman Catholic Church to be the actual blood of the Messiah, which denies the true blood of the Messiah, and plate 12 illustrates the revelation of the Messiah from heaven to restore the righteousness and the destruction of the earth and dwell therein, death or blood, into the lake of fire. Isaiah 24, 19 through 20, Nahum uh, 1 through 5, Revelations 20, 13 through 15. This same procedure can be traced with the water and the spirit witness in each plate by the pattern of the tabernacle. Plate number four that Moses received by vision in Mount Sinai, Exodus 25, 40. All right. Now, thank you. Now, I had that read about the dragon and the leopard here. Pagan Rome giving its power to papal Rome. Right. Now, let's read Revelations 13 and 1. Revelations 13. 13 and 1. Uh -huh. And I saw the beast rise up out of the sea, mm -hmm. having seven heads and ten horns mm -hmm. upon upon his heads, the names of blasphemy. Mm -hmm. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, mm -hmm. and his feet were as the feet of a bear, mm -hmm. and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Now see, now, John is confirming what we read in Daniel about these beasts. He's confirming that. Okay? Go ahead. And the dragon gave him his power mm -hmm. and his seat and a great authority. Mm -hmm. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Now I said one of the heads that were wounded to death. If you remember, when we read Nebuchadnezzar's dream, there was a rock cut out of the mountains without hands. 
that struck it at his feet. Right. See, which would be in the purview of Rome. That rock is Yahshua Messiah. This is the rock that struck that struck one of the heads, which is pagan Rome. In fact, Yahshua struck it at the height of the, of the of the, uh, at the height of the Roman Empire, because who was it was Augustus Caesar, who was Caesar, who was the first emperor of Rome. He was emperor when Yahshua was born. Uh -huh. So, so Yahshua came at the height of the Roman Empire. Okay, and see, he's that rock. See that wounded that beast. Okay, through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Okay. The weed. And his deadly wound was healed. Now that deadly wound that Joshua inflicted on pagan Rome, see it lasted for, for a few hundred years until pagan Rome was overthrown, talking about the Western Roman Empire, was overthrown by the, Vand by the Vandals, the Visigoths, and all these other you know, tribes, and it was overthrown. But see, but then the papacy filled the vacuum of power that was left by pagan Rome's absence. They feel, you know, in other words, see, they took paper Rome, got its, uh, its framework from pagan Rome. Maybe we can show that. <clears throat> yeah, we can. when Constantine, who was fighting to, to consolidate his empire, see, he was, he was trying to, you know, fight the, uh, the uh, anyway. He was trying to consolidate, and so he wanted, he, he needed a miracle. Right. So Yahweh sent him a strong delusion. All right. Yahweh sent him, he sent him a vision, a strong delusion. And he showed Constantine a vision of the sun, and under it were these letters. These letters and this and this um, phrase in Latin. All right, in hoc signo vinces. That means in in this sign conquer. Mm -hmm. So what Constantine did, he took this sign and he told his soldiers to put it on their shields. All right. And they won the day, ended up winning the day. So it was because of this battle that Constantine converted over to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And then he, once he consolidated his power, he made Christianity a state religion. See, see these two symbols here. See the, let's see, the X here, they're Greek letters. The X here represents CH. And the letter that looks like a P represents an R. So when you put it together, C-R-H, it would stand for Christ. Okay? So then Constantine, the, the church, they took what Constantine saw, and what they did was they, they incorporated it in their symbol by making it the keys, uh -huh. the keys of the Roman Catholic. If you ever see that, you know, the, key, the, the symbol of the keys, well, they got that from him. See, this is pagan Rome, Authority giving authority, passing the authority over to pagan Rome, mm -hmm. paper Rome, rather. See, that's how that deadly wound was healed. Ah, okay. See, it was Joshua that wounded him. Uh -huh. See, see, no mere meat man can can can, can wound the, the mystery of iniquity, but yeah, but Joshua did. He wounded them. But then pagan Rome, he wounded pagan Rome, and then pagan Rome gave his power and authority to paper Rome. And that was done with Constantine over here. See, after the Battle of Milvian Bridge. A deadly wound was healed. And that deadly wound was healed. Read, read the scripture. Who's reading? Okay. <laughs> and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, 
and his deadly wound was healed. Mm -hmm. And all the world wondered at the beast. And the whole world wondered after the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Because they were the ones that, that ran things over in this part of the world, in Europe. Okay, keep reading. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Mm -hmm. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Mm -hmm. See, because up here, remember we, we read with Daniel where there was a beast that was a little horn that came up out of that beast right. that had a mouth speaking great swelling things. See, the mouth and that horn was backed by the rest of this beast, which was pagan Rome. Mm -hmm. The framework that the Roman Catholic Church undertook is the framework that was of the pagan Roman Empire. Like, for example, uh, the Roman Catholic Church have dioceses, right? Where did they get that from? Pagan Rome. Because when pagan Rome had conquered their empire, they divided their empire up into different segments called dioceses. Mm -hmm. So they took that framework from them. Augustus Caesar, when he became the first emperor of Rome, he had the title of Pontifus Maximus, meaning the head. The head father of everything, the head. Pontifus Maximus. Is that what the Pope calls himself? He mm -hmm. took that from Augustus. Augustus Caesar was the one who, who took that title before his paper Rome was even created. But when the papacy came along to show that he was in authority, the Pope took on the title that Augustus Caesar had. Pontifex Maximus. At the top, the head. See, the trappings of pagan Rome became pagan, uh, pagan Rome became papal Rome. Mm -hmm. And that deadly wound was healed. Is there anything? And see, and we we read it in the textbook about we just read it in the textbook about about pagan Rome giving us power to pay. And see, and that's the type. Because see, Herod over here, we read it in the, I think it was in the previous session. We read about where Herod, he was king. Mm -hmm. How did he become king? It was the Roman Empire that made him king. Right. They invested him with a power and authority. That's why when Peter was put in prison, the, the, Roman, the, the guards that were guarding him, they were not Hebrews, they were Roman soldiers. Because they were there to prop Herod up. See? Okay? Uh, anything else there? Um, who is able to make war with him? Uh, see, that's, who's able to make war with this? Who's able to make war with this, Read. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. See, why? Because why? Because that's what we read in Daniel. See, the same thing here. John is just confirming that. Go ahead. And power was given unto him to continue mm -hmm. 40 and 2 months. 40 and 2 months, see? Now that goes back into the chronology thing we were talking about. See? Oh, boy. The falling apart. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. At least we got one, <laughs> so I'm glad for that. <laughs> okay, see, it goes back into, I said 42 months. If you remember, we talked about time, times, I said I don't have time to really go through all this, but I'm just going to do the, the quickie version here. All right, here's a time. A time is 360 days, see, well, which is according to Yahweh's timetable, all right? See, which is the same as 12 months, which is the same as one year. Times, because it's, it's, it's plural, is simply two times whatever it is up here. Mm -hmm. Two times 360 is what? <laughs> okay. I'm, don't feel bad. I need a calculator too at my, at my late stage of life sometimes. Uh, okay. See, 720. Yeah. All right, two times 12 months is 24 months. Two times one year? Two years. All right. The division of time is just half of whatever it is up here on the first line. Half of 360 is 180. Half of 12 months? Six. All right. Half of one year? All right. Now it's just a matter of addition. Just add up each column. This adds up to 1260 days. This adds up to 40 and two months, which we just read in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. All right? And this adds up to three and a half years. 
Alright? See? And say it was going to continue 40 and 2 months, right? Is that what this, that mm -hmm. said? Yeah. Yeah, read, read some more, see what else to say there. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against Yahweh mm -hmm. to blaspheme his name mm -hmm. and his tabernacle mm -hmm. and them that dwell in heaven. Mm -hmm. And it was given unto him to make war with the sons mm -hmm. and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues mm -hmm. and nations. That's it. The, the, the Roman Catholic Church is everywhere. All right, they, I mean, there's two billion, more than two billion strong. I mean, Christians are like what? Three billion. And two billion of that, I think, are Roman Catholics. You know, so they, they occupy everywhere. They're, 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 they are the mother church. Right. Of course. They're the mother of harlots. Okay? Now, read the last verse in that chapter. I think it's the 18th verse. Yes. Uh, Revelations 13, 18. Mm -hmm. Here is wisdom. Now, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the idol mm -hmm. of the beast. Mm -hmm. For it is in the number of a man. It's the number of a man. Go ahead. And his number is six hundred, three score and six. All right. In other words, six, six, six. Now we read earlier that this was forty. That uh, he was. That he was uh, forty-two months. He's doing this 42, which is the same as three and a half years, which is the same as 1260 days. Now, prophetic time, when we talk about prophetic time, see, uh, when we talk about time period, time, see, look, the day of eternity. Here's Yahweh, in the day, the cloud symbolizing eternity of Jerusalem, but the day. Time begins and ends within the realm of eternity. Then you have time with Yahweh Elohim, which is a thousand years is as one day, and one day is as a thousand years. Then you have time as pertaining to Yahshua, or put it like this. Here you have the day, the most holy place. Time with Yahweh Elohim, a thousand years is as one day, and one day is as a thousand years. Time with, with Yahshua, or time, or time with the prophetic time, rather, I'll put it like that. A day for a year, and one year for a day. See, this deals with the court round about with the flesh. Since Lucifer was cast out into the flesh, okay, we'll deal with him on that level. Because he said he's given 1260 days. So we'll use prophetic time, which is a day for a year, and a year for a day. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit was poured out here on the day of Pentecost in A.D. June 6, A.D. 33, okay? But now, Lucifer, who was incarnated in Judas Iscariot, see, he didn't see, 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 Yahshua, see, look, Yahshua picked 12 disciples, and the scripture says, have I not picked 12 disciples and one of you is a devil? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so Judas Iscariot was with, who Lucifer was incarnated, he saw Yahshua for three and a half years performing these cardinal ordinances. Alright? And even to the point that the disciples would ask Yahshua, why are you doing this? Why are you going here? Why are you going why are you? And you know that you know what the stock answer was talking about Yahshua? You know what he would just tell them? I'm fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Well, why are we going over here? I'm fulfilling. Well, but we're doing this, why are we doing this? I'm fulfilling. Okay? But now, and Judas Iscariot heard all this too. The problem was Judas Iscariot did, and Lucifer incarnated in him did not see the conclusion of the matter. Right. See, remember Satan is bruised in the head, see, with the number six. So at six, and look, there are seven steps in the tabernacle pattern. Six is one short of perfection. Right. So he's bruised in the head. He doesn't understand these, the, you know, the esoteric mysteries of the gospel. So as far as he's concerned, talking about Lucifer, see, he didn't see Yahshua conclude or end these cardinal orders. He saw Yahshua perform them, and he did perform them. But he did not see the conclusion of the matter. Okay? So therefore, as far as Lucifer is concerned, this is not June 6, A.D. 33, but this is just Yahshua's birthday in the flesh. So therefore, as far as Lucifer is concerned, this is A.D. Uh, 
This is AD 34. And now we just told you that there's 1260 and 42 months that we read in the scripture, which is the same as 1260. Prophetic time, a day for a year, we will take this 1260 and turn it to 1260 years. That will bring us up to AD 1294. Now, the significant thing about this is, this date, you can look it up, that's when this guy, Pope Boniface VIII, he issued the papal bull called mm -hmm. Unam, Unam, oh boy, to start over. All right. Unam. This stuff you can look up. Sanctum. Sanctum. This is a papal bull. And it is some bull too. <laughs> but what he, but basically what he's saying here is that the Pope, as we said, he took on the title that Augustus Caesar had of Pontifex Maximus. So now he's saying through this document, he's saying that the Pope has total authority over all ecclesiastical matters. That means your soul. And he has authority over all temporal matters. That means the world, the governments of the world. In other words, he is king and high priest of the world. That's what he's saying from this document, which was issued in 1294 A.D. And it's a bull. See, the word bull, let's not throw this in here. See, a bull, a bull. See, the word bull comes from the Italian word Bulla. The word bulla in Italian is it means it's a clasp. Because see when when the when, when the Pope would issue a bull or, or a statement or something like Unum Sanctum, they would be it on a parchment and they would roll it up and they would put a clasp on it. That clasp was called a bulla. Hmm. That's why it was called, oh, here comes the papal bull. Okay. This is a root word that we even use in, in our country, in, our, in the English language. This is the root word for a word that we use. And that word is a bulletin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, our, that's the American version of a paper bull. A bulletin. Oh, no, all right, we're in our newsroom. We got a bulletin coming in here. You know, get it? Now, she read 666. We'll take 666 and we'll apply prophetic time to it, a day for a year. And see, in 666, when you add on to this, it will bring you to... A.D. 1960, which is the end of the present age. Mm -hmm. See, and that's right there in the scripture. We just read it. See? Okay? And that's when Dr. Kinley uh, put out his book in 1961 and said that the Roman Catholic Church was flatter than the fritter. Okay? Now, what am I at here? Boy. Well, I got a little bit, but I still didn't get to where I want, so obviously I'm going to have to do a third part. Because I wanted to get here. The England, the England, the England. It made me think of Jerry Lee Lewis in that movie, the guy, but, you know, they kicked him out, you know, the last thing is, England and kiss mine. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was the funniest line in that movie. Booty. England and kiss mine. <laughs> anyway. And England, and, and England's a very important part because England also was part of the pagan Roman Empire. It was the northern extent of it. See this, see this line right here? This yellow line that goes up right here? That represents the border between Scotland and, and England. And that also represents Hadrian's Wall, Emperor Hadrian. See, that was, the, that was the furthest extent of the Roman Empire which was also part of England, like London, you know, Londinium, as it was called, you know, was a, was a Roman province at one time, so, okay? So, so, you know, so England has strong ties, you know, to both pagan Rome and papal Rome. And see, we have the word wife here, and we have the word husband up here. The reason why is because Henry VIII, see, divorced his country from the husband, the Roman Catholic Church, and created the Church of England with himself as the head of it. So virtually, they had he was king and high priest <laughs> of the Anglican Church. All right, he just he pretty much just imitated 
what the Pope did. And just put it in, in, an, angry, in, in an angry term. A couple of things he did different, like with the popes, uh, the bishops, they, they're not allowed to get married. Whereas the, the folks here in England, uh, the Archbishop of Canada, he can get married. You know, they didn't deny it. They said, no, you go, go and get your wife. You know, see, because it was the king. Because at the end of it was the king. And see, there was a reason why the Roman Catholics didn't want their priests to marry. Because when you married, if you're married and you, know, you own property and stuff like that, and you may have kids by the woman that you're married by. So when you die, your property and belongings will go to your wife and to your offspring. Well, by getting rid of that, by having the priest not be married, uh -huh. if they acquired things, property, money, whatever, when they died, the stuff would just go to the church. Mm -hmm. See? Okay? Now, I brought that up because, see, England is part of, the, well, from England, England, you know, this was an, England was an empire, the British Empire, you know, and then they, and this is a really good story about how they got that way. And, uh, in fact, uh, they became, actually, there's a movie that's coming out I'm definitely going to see. It's uh, the movie on Napoleon Bonaparte. Mm -hmm. You know, I definitely want to go see that. Because, see, Napoleon created an empire in Europe after the French had their revolution, okay, over the king, and so, and so, him, so Napoleon Bonaparte stepped in, and with the sanction of the church, because he, see, they, he made an agreement with the church, saying, you know, he, had, he said, well, I'll let you guys, you know, hang around, you know, if you if you let me be, you know, emperor, and you know, I won't give you a property yet, but I'll let you still be in church, and you know that kind of thing. They said, okay, and so they agreed with it, and they let it, and they went along with it, and Napoleon, for the most part, conquered pretty much much of Europe, okay with the sanction of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the British, the British had to fight him twice. First was the, uh, the battle of the naval battle, see, because the Britons, British had, had great navy. Mm -hmm. So that was the battle at Trafalgar. You can read, look and look about about Lord Nelson, you know, the battle of Trafalgar, which he won against the Napoleonic forces. But Lord Nelson, unfortunately, got killed. You know, the guy who won the war actually got killed. And then they sent him to an island out here in, in the, uh, the Mediterranean. Okay, I'm, I'm dead. Oh, there I am. Yeah, so they sent him out to the exile him to an island in the, in the Mediterranean Sea in Corsica. And then he was able to, to escape from there and reorganize a, a, another army and conquered France again, which was called the Hundred Days Rule. Mm. And then, they, then the British had to come back and fight him again. And that's the so called famous Battle of Waterloo. You know, Waterloo, Waterloo, mm -hmm. Waterloo, baby, in Waterloo. <laughs> yeah. I remember that song. But that's based on an actual battle. That, that was Napoleon. That was his second go-round, and the British defeated him on that. And then after that, that's when the British began. Well, they were starting their ascendancy, but really took off after that. All right? As other, you know, as Napoleon was put down, and the British began to conquer, you know, began to go around the world. America was one, you know, was one of these colonies that the British made, and America is a breakaway colony mm -hmm. from the British Empire. But a lot of the things that the British came up with, America took from that, and even enshrined it in the Constitution of the United States. You know, things like, uh, yes ma'am, I know, now yes I'm ready, thank you much. <laughs> Man, that is refreshing. Okay. And so, and a lot, like I say, like, um, yeah, the things that are in the Constitution. I'm just trying to, I know I don't have much time to get into it, but at least I got, I got this far, and next time we, we will get into this a little bit more. Because I've been meaning to get into this thing about America, because people, see, the thing that gets me is, people have this idea, and it's because of propaganda, because I, I went to school too here. And they want to tell you, well, America is the shiny city on the hill and all of that. When really, America is just a, comp you know, a compilation of all these different empires. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, when they say, well, it's a type of the new covenant, and all, which I think is the dumbest statement I ever heard. No. They, and, and, and here's another thing that gets me. See, people will say that these uh, founding fathers, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin and all these folks, they were stout, upstanding Christians. Like hell they were. They were not, you know. These were people. They, they were products of the age of enlightenment. 
See, and, and see, and that started in France, actually, and spread it to England, and England more or less promoted it. See, people like, uh, you know, like, uh, well, and the, and the English, this guy, he used to, you should read up on him, this guy here, John, John Locke, all right, and which some of his ideas are incorporated, as I said, incorporated in the, in the Constitution of the United States, and the ideas that the so-called founding fathers had, you know, what they call, you know, enlightenment of the mind, the modern era. These are the modern thinkers, you know, that kind of thing. And we tell you about history. History is threefold, right? Because you have ancient history, you have ancient history, you have medieval history, and you have the modern history. And see, and these are the people of the modern history, the, the so-called enlightenment, get it? You know, because this is where the flash of the Shekinah is, you know, be, to be enlightened, right? So Satan, <laughs> Satan is the same way, you know, enlightenment. Yeah, we're going to look back, because that's what they did. I'm talking about the founding fathers. They didn't, people said, well, they went to the Bible and took them. No, they didn't. That is such a big lie. They went back and looked at, you know, what Rome had did. They looked at what the Greeks had did. The Greeks were the ones that came up with democracy, see? And Rome took from the Greeks mm -hmm. because it was Plato who wrote, who wrote the book, what was the name of the, the book, The Republic, which, you know, goes through and about, you know, his viewpoint of what a good government is. The Romans took from that. And they created the first of a, a Roman Republic before it came an empire, and then that's when they created a Senate, which was a, their form of representative government. The United States went back and said, oh, well, we get democracy from the idea from the Greeks, and the idea of the Senate, we, we took that from the Romans. Mm -hmm. See, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Ben Franklin, they, they looked to the past. And they say, well, let's take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of the other, and I think we can do something better with it. That was their idea. That was their form of government. But now you had other people that had other ideas about what they thought government was. And in the early 19th century, you had people like, like Karl Marx, see, and Friedrich Engels, who came up with the idea of communism. And see, and that was the thing that I wanted to bring that out because we read that. We read that in the uh, in the uh, um, in Daniel. We remember when we read in Daniel about the feet. Right. And said they were part iron, part miry clay. And see, now they would they said that they would adhere to the seed of men, but they would not adhere to each other. Now why? It's because of the two different systems. See, the two different see, or Satan's kingdom divided against himself. Right. See, and these two systems. Now, the two systems that Dr. Kelly identified was the Roman Catholic system. And the communist system. Now, if I could find this right quick, because I know I'm running out of time, but I'll, I'll get this in here, and then we can continue uh, in the next time. The communism. Uh, Marxism, Marxism, my, 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 my. Where's the manifesto? Where are you at? Where are you at? Domino theory. Three fifty. Okay. So during uh, that time when uh, George Washington were fighting against the, the English, mm -hmm. they were writing up a constitution at the same time? Because they wanted uh, yeah, Washington well, to be the first president. Well, the, after, after they defeated the British, they first came up with the Articles of Confederation. Mm -hmm. And that they operated under that, and that didn't work, so that's when they scrapped that. And then they came up with the Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights and uh, the system of the Constitution and the system of 
creating amendments mm -hmm. to the Constitution. That's why we have, have them as they are. Uh, I know it's in here because I read it, the Communist Manifesto. Ah, uh, connection to the oh, where you at? I know it's close by. Ah, here we go. I'll read it since I'm, I got it right here. All right, this is Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, okay? And, uh, and when did they do this? If this was in 18... Uh, it was in the early 19th century, something like that, okay? All right. Now, this is the Communist Manifesto. This is what was written by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. This is what they said. And they said, that, well, see, uh, okay, well, let me read this, this claim, this proclaimer. Now, in the Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels projected the creation of a classless society as the final end product of the struggle between the bourgeoisie hmm. and the proletariat. In other words, this was, this was their premise. Because, see, Karl Marx was Jewish, but he was an atheist Jew. But he looked back on history, and he, and, and he, and see, and Dr. H. Kennedy even mentioned this in one of his lectures. He said that, like the Russians, and see, and the Russians, they who were communists at the time, they took up Karl Marx's um, viewpoint, and said this was called the materialistic, material, material, materialism. See, or the materialistic view of history. Now, when we see materialism, most people think of buying and selling, you know, oh, you're just materialistic because you want all these goods, <laughs> which is one definition. But the original definition of materialism is that it's a belief in the system that there's no such thing as metaphysics, something beyond the, uh, the physical. Mm -hmm. See, the, the, um, of land, you know, of, of water, you know, air, I mean, of, of solid liquids and, and gases. There's nothing beyond the physical. See, so, you know, in other words, matter is the only thing that really matters. Sure. See, and, that's, and, see, and so, so communism is inherently an atheist system because it denies the metaphysical. It deals with the physical. So if you're talking metaphysical, they'll just look at you and say, well, you must be crazy. Hmm. You're hearing voices because there's nothing beyond right. the physical. So therefore, a true communist, a true communist, because people will throw the terms out, oh, you're a communist, a, a true communist is an atheist, truly. Now, not all atheists are communists, but all communists, all true communists are atheists. They don't believe in a God, because right. they say man is at the center of the universe. And so that's why when, uh, what's his name, the guy who started the Soviet Union in Russia, um, Vladimir Lenin, they preserved, you know, because they were so wrapped up in the physical, they said, well, this guy must have been a genius. They preserved his body in a, in a mausoleum in a, in a, that you could yeah, visit yeah. In, a, in a museum, you know, that you could walk. For decades, 70, 80 years, you know, they preserved his body. See, that's just how much tied into the physical, the materialism, see. And so... Strasky so, and Lenin. Yeah, see, all that. So now I'm going to read, this is what Karl Marx and Friedrich the Eagles wrote about this. They said... See, because they said this, that the problem, this is what Marx said, the problem is it's property, because the rich people own the property. So therefore, he, he reasoned that to make a classless society, the state should own the property. <laughs> therefore, let everybody else, you know, like that, you know, and capitalism was just one stage to get into socialism, and then we'll get to that utopian stage of communism. See, even that's threefold. <laughs> if you ever noticed. See, first capitalism, then socialism, then communism. The thing is, there's no communist country on the face of the earth because to be a communist, a true communist country, means that it would have to be some kind of utopia. Hmm. And even though China is called a communist country, because they do practice socialist principles, it's definitely not a utopia. Okay? Because that hasn't happened yet. Now, let me read this so we get out of here. All right. Now, this is what Karl Marx says. When in the course of development, class distinctions have disappeared and all production has been concentrated in the whole nation, the public power will lose its political character. Political power, properly so called, is merely the organized power of one class for oppressing another. If the proletariat, during its contest with the bourgeoisie, is compelled by the force of circumstances to organize itself as a class, 
if by means of a revolution it makes itself the ruling class and as such sweeps away all, sweeps away by force the old conditions of production, then it will, along with these conditions, have swept away the conditions for the existence of class antagonisms and of classes generally, and will thereby have abolished its own supremacy as a class in place of the old bourgeoisie society with its classes and class antagonism, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. The communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communist revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their change. They have a world to win. Mm. Working men of all countries unite. That was the Communist Manifesto. And that still rings clear to a lot of people around the globe. All right? But that's what I'm talking about when we, went, we talked about feet made of miry clay and part iron, part miry clay. That's what that's talking about here. See, the Catholic, see, you have, see, and Dr. Kelly identified in this book of the Roman Catholics versus the Communism, and both of them, you know, have designs, you know, world conquest, and they're the six, the successors had one thing in mind, world conquest. But Satan's kingdom is divided against itself. See, and then, and we'll get into that. So we're out of time. We'll, we'll get into that next time. See, look, matter of fact, get the, let me read this. Whew. Revelation 17, chapter 17 and 4. Let's just read that right quick. Is yeah. that the lead up to the, the, the murder of the Caesar? His family? The Tsar? Well, yeah, well, there was the communists. You know, they, the Tsar, you know, they were, you know, well, the Tsar, you know, they were, they felt they were a royal family. Mm -hmm. They said that they were the third Rome. See, that, that's another story. So I, I've been watching this one, I've been binge watching this series on, my, on Mehmed, you know, the, the, the founder of the Ottoman Empire. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and oh, it was, this one set of series, they had him fighting against Vlad Dracula. <laughs> and, and, you know, because, see, people think of Dracula. You know the vampire legend, all, but there actually was a person right. named Vlad Vlad Dracula. That was his name, because the word Dracula, Dracula means the son of the dragon, and he was a ruler, and he fought against the Ottoman Empire. You know, and it's a true story, and it's really so. Oh man, the guy was gruesome. The reason why the, the vampire legend came out of him, because Vlad Vlad Dracula was a was a very bloody man. If he didn't like you, he would impale you. You know, he would get a the long those long point and would stick it up your you know, yeah, yeah, and you'd be sticking it through your chest. You'd be just be hanging there, and he did that to thousands of people. Oh, I mean, man. there was one where the Ottomans came in, and they did a depiction on the TV where it was hundreds. It was like a forest of impaled people, hundreds of them. They call it the forest of corpses, you know, because there was like hundreds of people impaled on strike. On, 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 you know, that's just how ruthless he was. But anyway, read. Revelation 17 and 4. Uh -huh. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon mm -hmm. the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the sons and with the blood of the martyrs of Yahshua. Okay, now see Daniel, I mean of John, is confirming what we read in Isaiah. Remember we read in Isaiah about that, about that Leviathan and the woman, you know, this, he's just confirming that. But quickly read. We need to and when I saw her, I wondered with great astonishment. Mm -hmm. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore art thou astonished? Mm -hmm. I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which had the seven heads and ten horns. Mm -hmm. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, mm -hmm. and shall ascend out of the abyss mm -hmm. and go into perdition. Mm -hmm. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life Read. from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was mm -hmm. and is not and yet is. And seeing a past, present, and future. In other words, it's, it's coming on down from, from, from the angelic creation all the way down to now. Quickly. Mm -hmm. 
And here is the mind which hath wisdom. Mm -hmm. The seven heads are seven mountains mm -hmm. on which the woman sitteth. See now that the seven hills are Rome. See, that's one thing. But John is also looking back over the expanse of history. See, a mountain is a kingdom. A typology is a type of a kingdom. So there's seven kingdoms that have come all the way down from Adam and Eve. Seven universal dynasties. Hmm. Quickly. And there are seven kingdoms. Uh -huh. Five are fallen. Now, in his John of the Isle of Patmos, five of these are fallen. See, by the time John, in AD 96, city of Enoch, Tower of Babel, which was the first Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, the second Babylonian Empire, Medes and Persians, then the Greeks. Those five were fallen by AD 96 here, and, and with John on the Isle of Patmos, read. And one is. Now, the one that is is pagan Rome. See, that existed in 1896. It was pagan Rome, Emperor Trajan to be exact, who, I, who exiled John out there on the Isle of Patmos. This was not Paradise Island for him. This was a prison. Now, one exists. The pagan Rome, read. And the other is not yet come. Now, in 1896, papal Rome had not yet come. But what? And when it cometh, uh -huh. it must continue a short space. Now, when it do come, it must continue a short space. Why? Because we read that, remember? It was wounded. Right. See? By that rock, it was wounded, but then that wound was healed. See, and the whole world wondered after that beast quickly. And the beast that was mm -hmm. and is not, mm -hmm. even he is the eighth head. Now, now he, now there's these seven kingdoms. See, since 1960, see these seven kingdoms has have, have uh, consolidated. See, have consolidated. See, these seven into the eighth head. In other words, everything that has come down the pipe, the characteristics of these kings are now being made manifested now in the eighth kingdom, which is all the whole world. Quickly. Mm. And is of the seven, mm -hmm. and goeth into perdition. And goes into perdition, or it's going to, this is the state of the world that's going to go in into destruction on it, quickly. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, mm -hmm. which have received no kingdom as yet. Mm -hmm. that, at that time, 1896, but now we're down here, see, in the 19th, and they have received kingdoms. Now, go ahead. And receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And one hour with the beast. See that hour. See in 1960. That's when, because that's when the end was. We just showed you. And so within that hour, the last, these kingdoms, these these kings, now they got power now. Go ahead. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Mm -hmm. These shall make war with the lamb, mm -hmm. and the lamb shall overcome them, mm -hmm. for he is the mighty ruler of kings. Mm -hmm. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Mm -hmm. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples. They're the peoples. It's the world. See, this is where these kingdoms and these ten this is where they rise up out of. See, out of the sea of men, quickly. Mm -hmm. And multitudes and nations and tongues. Mm -hmm. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, mm -hmm. and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. In other words, Satan's kingdom divided against itself. The Roman Catholic system versus the communists. Mm -hmm. Satan's kingdom divided against itself, quickly. For Yahweh hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, mm -hmm. and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, mm -hmm. until the words of Yahweh shall be fulfilled. Okay, good enough. Quickly read Philippians 3 and 20, and we'll be out of here. Philippians 3 and 20. Mm -hmm. For our citizenship is in heaven, mm -hmm. from whence also we are expecting our Savior King, Yahshua the Messiah who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Okay, good enough. See, now that's the true citizenship we belong to. That's the true kingdom. Yeah, we're in the world, you know. I even got a passport, so if I travel somewhere, they would say, who are you? And I pull my passport out and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's the world we have to deal with. Dr. Kinley said this, I said, we will obey the laws of the world, see, the laws of man, as long as it does not interfere with our divine right to worship Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. All right? 
I hope I got a little farther with this today. Next week, I'm going to try to get a little farther. But I hope, read the, pre the previous session and combine it with this, and next week, we, hopefully, we can take it on home. So, all right. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope that something was said today was edifying, okay? The things that I write on that whiteboard, please take the time to research them. Look them up, see if they're so or not, okay? As always, be safe, be healthy, but most of all, be in Yahshua the Messiah. Why? Because he most truly is your only hope of glory. And with those few words, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Alrighty. So we come to the end of class. Uh, thank everybody for the donation because we do need them. You know, nobody gets paid here, not profit. Okay, and uh, say a uh, shout out to everybody that's uh, listening to us and uh, watching uh, us live. Okay, I ask Annette to come up here again, Doxology, so we can be dismissed. Let us all stand to be dismissed. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.